Number four, a solid sphere and a hoop. Each are sliding with an initial linear velocity, V naught, but without any rotational velocity across a slick level surface. They both suddenly encounter a surface with friction. The surface has a coefficient of kinetic friction mu k and a coefficient of static friction mu s. How far do the objects slip before they begin rolling and which travels further before transitioning to rolling? The hoop travels farther before transitioning to rolling because it's harder to turn, all things being equal. So it's gonna probably travel farther before it begins rolling. We'll prove it here in a minute, but I, I'm pretty sure that's going to be true. So I can, I'll give you the choice. I can pick one of these and do it in terms of that particular one, or I could do it in terms of I for the moment of inertia, and then you can plug in the moment of inertia at the end. But I'll tell you, doing it in terms of I is probably gonna be kind of messy. So your call. Nope, the person who asked. Go ahead, in terms of I. All right, so there's three things that are, are kind of at play here. There's the fact that the object is traveling at a, you know, at some initial velocity, V naught, and is doing so while sliding. And then there's going to be the point where they hit the area where there's friction. And they're going to begin to experience a torque that's going to cause rotational acceleration. While at the same time, they're gonna be experiencing a force that's going to slow down their linear velocity. And then eventually they'll make it to a point where they are rolling. And at this point, V will equal omega times R. Okay. That is the condition for rolling. There are two things happening at once in this problem. There's a torque causing a change in rotational speed. And there's a force causing a negative acceleration to slow down the object. The forces acting on the system are friction, weight, and just to have a different color for the arrows, normal force. So let's choose one side of this problem to work first. That will be the net force equals ma and the object has an initial velocity v naught and an initial acceleration of zero. So that our starting part? Everybody understand all these things? All right, T equals zero begins the moment it hits the frictional area. All right, that's also where we're measuring the distance from. So the distance it takes to come to rest, or I'm sorry, to come to rolling will be this distance here. And it's at this moment, some kind of T final, where the um, object is now rolling and is no longer transitioning. The only force that's causing a change in the velocity is the frictional force, and it's negative. And it's kinetic friction. Um, that's not enough now, except that I know that I could use net force in the Y direction to get an expression for the normal force, which will allow me to write this acceleration in terms of things that we're allowed to have in our answer, which seem to include things like mu and m and stuff like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and replace this with mu k m g equals m a. We've done this problem in class before, so I feel like I can kind of skip some of the parts and that's all right. Now, that means that my acceleration equals um, negative mu k times g. There's a couple of different approaches from here, but since I found acceleration, I could also state that my initial velocity is v naught, uh, starting at time equals zero. 
So I'll just put T here as a placeholder. I need delta X, which is gonna be D, and uh, maybe some final velocity, I don't know. Uh, it's a motion equation thing, is what I'm trying to get at. Um, I can structure this to find either D or um, T, but the truth is, I don't know which one of these I can find right now. I have too many unknowns. I mean, I know the initial velocity is V naught. It can be in my answer. But I don't know how far it goes. I don't know what the final velocity is. I don't know how long it takes. And I'm trying to find D, so D can't be in my answer. So I need another piece of information. I'm going to use torque as my other piece of information. Um, I have to choose, though, and again, I'll, I'll let you choose. Where do I want to, want to choose my pivot point to be for my application of torque? I have one suggestion. I think we use the center of mass of the wheel. I think it makes the most sense because I think the frictional force is causing this torque. Is that good for you? All right. So I'm going to choose my pivot point to be right here, and that means that my net torque equals I alpha. The torque is going to be the frictional force, and we have an expression for the frictional force already. So um, I just want to remind you that a torque is a torque arm times a force times the sine of an angle. So my torque arm is the radius of the, the sphere or the hoop times the force, which is mu k mg equals I alpha. All good there? Not a lot I can do with that, except I can get an expression for this acceleration. And this acceleration, it's going to be a little messy, but it's not terribly so. Mu k m g r divided by i. We're leaving in terms of i on purpose, but we know that i is going to contain m and r in it somehow. So the m would have canceled and the R would have probably canceled, but the R would have been squared, so there'd probably still be an R in the answer somewhere. I'm not going to worry too much about that because I think that will work out in the end, but I'm going to leave this as my acceleration. It has an initial velocity of zero. We don't know the final velocity. The thing that I want to point out about this problem is that this is about the motion equations that we're deriving. The object is slowing down, while it's speeding up, but eventually V has to equal omega times R. I'm going to find out how long it takes to do that. And the reason I'm going to do that is because that's the equation that brings everything together the simplest. I could probably find out the distance directly if I wanted to, but that's a more complicated equation with time squares or other squares in it. I think it'll be easier to find the time first, and then once I find the time, find the distance. So that's the method I'm going to choose. So I'm going to construct two relationships, one about the linear velocity, one about the angular velocity, and then I'm going to use this relationship to find out when they're equal. Everybody okay so far? All right. So V equals A T plus V naught and omega equals alpha t plus omega naught. I want to find out the time when these two things are equal, so I will set them equal to each other. So negative mu k g t plus v naught equals mu k m g r over i t plus zero times r. I'm finding when these two things are equal. So because I'm finding when these two things are equal, t represents when. Right? 
So let's find out when. I'm going to solve this for t. Uh, I'll distribute the r. And when I do, I get mu k g times m r squared over i times t. I just distributed the r, and I, I grouped the m r squared together. That should make reasonable sense because we know the moment of inertia of whatever we put in there is going to have m r squared in it. And the right side, I'm going to leave the same for just a moment. I need to get the things with T on the same side. So I'll move this to the other side. I will factor out the T and solve for it. I did some substitution in there because I can do algebra in my head. You might want extra steps, but this is just me going over homework. Um, I'm bringing this up too because no matter what I put in for I, everything in here is just going to be some number, isn't it? Because if I put in mr squared for I, that would be the hoop, then that will just be 1 plus 1 equals 2. Correct? And if I put in, say, oh, I don't know, um, two-fifths mr squared in there. The mr squared will cancel, and I'll just get five-halves plus one. It does tell me, though, which one takes longer to get there. We're just doing a little bit of the math, right? All right. So um, should we keep going? This is not the answer. Or is it at this moment that you want to um, put in one of the shapes? So like now would probably be a good time to put in one of the shapes. So, which shape do you want to put in? What's that? Okay. Put in a hoop. This becomes V naught over 2 mu k g. And this is how long it takes to go from sliding to rolling. And it had an initial velocity of V naught. And I'm trying to find out the delta X. So I'm going to use a, maybe another motion equation here. So I'll use the one that has acceleration in it. Maybe, yeah, that'll do. One half <coughs> AT squared, all that. Is that good for you guys? So the acceleration is still negative mu k g. So, and this is our distance, that's what we're solving for. So distance equals one half a t squared plus v naught times t. Everybody all good? Any questions about what I've done? Um, this term on the right is V naught squared over 2 mu k g. The term on the left, I square top and bottom. That's going to give me a 4 mu k g squared. But there's a mu k g here out front. So I think this will just be V naught squared over 4 mu kg um, and negative 1 half out front. Any question about where those came from? All right, so I just got to add um, negative 1 half times negative 1 fourth, or I'll just bring the 4, uh, I don't know. Do you, if you don't have a preference, we can just add these things together by getting common denominators, right? So... This is 8. So to make this one 8, I do 4 and uh, four and 8 like that. And then subtract. And it looks like I'm going to get D equals 
Um, three V naught squared over eight mu K G. It's a lot of algebra. Um, keep in mind, that's where the moment of inertia is in all of this. If you had had two-fifths MR squared, you'd have a different number for the two there, and that would change the answer here. Um, that's a lot of algebra. Are our units right? Because our answer should be in uh, meters, right? So the top is meters squared per second squared because it's velocity squared. And the bottom, the only thing with units is G, that's meters per second squared. So it looks like the second squareds cancel out and one of the m's cancels out. That's highly suggestive that our answer will be in meters. That seems reasonable. And let's see, what makes the distance go further? If I'm going faster, does that make sense? Sure does. Um, what else makes sense? Um, G creates friction. If there's no G, then the thing would never have friction, so it would just keep sliding forever. All right, that makes sense. If it's a stickier surface, does that make it slow down sooner? Or get to spinning sooner? Sure does. Does it make sense that it's in the denominator? Sure does. Yeah, all those things make sense. The three-eighths, that's just the product of, the, of the, the moment of inertia and the mass and how the role it all played. Mass canceled out, though. So, again, it's more about the shape of the object than it is its mass. This has been on the AP exam. That's a bunch of algebra, isn't it? There is another way to do it, but it's not necessarily easier. Um, because it involves energy. You could do it as an energy discussion and use the work energy formula to get to the velocity. It's not better because work is done by friction to spin it, but work is also taken away because it slides. So it's not better. This is about as easy as the problem is, except you could have not solved for the time and solved for the distance here directly. It's not easier. It just would have been more cumbersome algebra at the front end and less complicated at the back end. All right. I'm happy with all that. Everything you had there was a standard conservation of energy question. The energy in the system, and if somebody wants me to explain a different part of it, speak now before I, I neglect all of this. I, I, I do. I think you would have to know that to be able to do the problem. So this is what I envision this problem looks like. Is this what you envision this problem looks like? Okay. Um, any reason to believe that the motion of this pulley is connected to the motion of this block? In fact, I think that's what the last question is asking, really. So, um, yes, I do think that you can say V equals omega times R here. And if you can say that, then you can say delta x is equal to delta theta times r, which means one meter equals 0 0.25. Is it 0.25? Is that the radius? 0.25 delta theta. That'll give you your answer in radians, which looks to be four radians. You'll just need to convert that into degrees now if you want the answer. What's that? Welcome. Um, as an energy problem goes, this box has gravitational potential energy equal to mg times 1. Correct? When it falls 1 meter, at the lowest point, if we assume the lowest point is 1 meter below, it has no gravitational potential energy and has only one-half mv squared of kinetic energy, while at the same time, the wheel starts with no energy at all and now has one-half i omega squared of kinetic energy. This plus this has to equal the amount of potential energy we started with. That's how you solve that problem using just energy. I think that's probably faster than doing net force and net torque. But you have to, you have to know how far it fell. All right. Speak to all of it, but I'll also say refer to the one we did in class. Um, the only difference is that I think 
the size of it's a little different, but the kids are all 60 and it's still 200 kilograms. So the kids, there's four of them. And the system starts at a speed of six radians per second. That's my recollection. Yep. And the kids are all 60 kilograms. And this thing is 200 kilograms and has a radius of two meters. There's a certain amount of, of kinetic energy in the system and the system has a certain angular momentum. When the kids walk to the center, all the kids walk to the center, they reduce the moment of inertia of the system. And because of that, they increase the angular velocity of the system because the angular momentum of the system has to stay the same. So the first part of the problem is to say the angular momentum before the kids walk to, towards the center has to equal the angular momentum after the kids walk to the center. You'll need to find the initial moment of inertia and the final moment of inertia. The disc doesn't change, but the kids do. The kids are what doing the work. So when you find the new velocity, you need to, to recognize that the kinetic energy changed. And the before kinetic energy is one half I B omega B squared. And the final kinetic energy will be one half I A omega A squared. Um, this number is greater than this number because the speed was squared. Because of that, it has more kinetic energy when the kids walk to the center than it did before. Uh, to find how much work was done by the kids, use the work energy theorem. We don't know what the force is. Uh, by the way, you do, an, you do know what the force is. So before I say you don't know what the force is, you should understand something that I could most certainly ask. There has to be a force in this direction, right? To keep the kids traveling in a circular path. That force decreases as they get closer to the center, but they must apply a force at least greater than that to walk towards the center. That's the size of the force they have to apply. The problem is that as they're walking to the center, omega is increasing, but also their distance away from the center is decreasing. So that force is the centripetal force. Well, a force that causes <coughs> centripetal acceleration. It's probably friction. So it's an odd calculation because as r is getting smaller, omega is getting bigger, and this is the size of the frictional force that they must work against to get to the center. We can't use our typical rules of work to do that calculation because those two variables are changing while he's walking towards the center. But all you gotta do is change, do the delta K. At the moment of inertia of a thick ring, um, there's two different ways you can do this problem. Um, I have presented the disc before, and I've presented the ring before. So we've seen both of those. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I could just say, can we start this with the ring problem and go all the way to the part in the ring problem where we set the limits? No, I'm sorry, not the ring problem, the disc problem. I, I could say, can we just go to the disc problem and go to the part where we set the limits on the disc problem and start from there? Or I could show you how to do the problem from scratch. It's your call. You tell me what you want because you asked. Start from scratch. Okay, so in the disc problem, we reach a point where we have determined that dm is equal to r d theta, no, not r d theta, hold on. dm is equal to sigma dA, where sigma represents the surface density of the disc. And I probably wrote it more like m over pi r squared dA. And then for dA, I replaced it with uh, probably R d theta dr. I got that from drawing a small square somewhere on the disk and then identifying a corner of that square, pointing to it using R and theta, and then defining the size of that square in terms of R and theta. Does that sound familiar? 
So I would have then said, after you get to this point, you need to construct an integral that could be used to solve for the moment of inertia, starting with our definition of moment of inertia, which is r squared dm, where r represents the perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation to your square. Well, from that conversation, you should remember that this r squared, this r, and this r are the same r based on that definition. Doesn't have to be. And I've showed at least one class when that would not be the same r. But I think for this one, we all know that we're talking about if the square were right here someplace, this r would be that, right? Pointing to a single piece. And because I know I need to, this would be dr, if this is r, and this side is r d theta. It's an arc length. That's how we get the area of that piece. All still familiar? All righty. Well, we're going to have to make some concessions about this one, things that are different. This is the disk. So, so far, everything is more or less true, except this. That is not true for a disk. For the disk, it would be uh, the area of this thick, I'm sorry, the area of the thick ring would be pi r outer squared minus pi r inner squared. That's the, the surface area of a thick ring. I take the whole disk and subtract the whole. Does that make sense? All right. So, moving on. Uh, I factored all stuff out, set my limits. Um, I'm just gonna execute this integral, right? Not a whole lot to do here, but let's get it done. Um, first, for the time being, can I just write that all as sigma so I don't have to keep rewriting it every single time? Um, so I'm, I'm saying all of this, I'm just gonna write as this little symbol for a few minutes. Um, let's do the next integral. It's just r cubed dr, so that is a, a um, a polynomial, so I just add one to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. So that's going to be, oops, I don't need the integral symbol anymore. That's going to be one fourth r to the fourth evaluated from the inner radius to the outer radius times, okay, d theta, so that's theta to the zero power. I'll use the polynomial function there again. That's going to be theta to the one power evaluated from zero to two pi, so that'll just be two pi minus zero. All right, so next, keep my sigma for just a minute. That's going to be one quarter uh, r zero to the fourth minus one quarter r i to the fourth, all times two pi. All right, all good so far? All right. M over pi r o squared minus pi r i squared. Um, I'm going to factor out the one fourth and the two and just have a, a two here. And I'm going to recognize I can cancel out the pi in both of these. And that's going to leave me with r o to the fourth minus r i to the fourth. Everything good there? Just doing some cleaning up. So this doesn't look like the answer, except that when I clean it up a little bit more, and I know that I have some, some incredibly uh, uh, intelligent mathletes in the room. I'm bordering, bordering on somewhat arrogant, to be honest. So I, I should you know, because, you know, they love to tell me how smart they are, hit them with this. But there's a way to simplify this, and you should know what it is. And, and I know that because I think you should know it usually disappoints me in the end. So um, r to the fourth minus r to the fourth is the difference of squares. So I can write this as r squared o minus r i squared times r o squared plus r i squared. I would expect you guys know this as mathletes. 
and could have done that to see that these cancel as long as they are non-zero and we know that they are non-zero. So because of that, I can write this as one half m r o squared plus r i squared. I think we can do that in three minutes in this class because you guys have the added benefit of having had the conversation about the momentum of a point mass. So it'll take me a second to, to kind of draw this, but I'll do my best to try and do it quickly. All right, so we have something that looks like that. It is a rod of length L, mass M, and this is, I'm sorry, this is mass M1, and this is mass M2. Um, we are looking top down on this. I drew an extra picture because this represents the moment of contact. Fair enough? All right. Um, in this problem, momentum is not conserved but angular momentum is conserved. And I'm saying that clearly because linear momentum is not conserved because of the pivot point. The pivot point applies an external force on the system during the collision. And because of that, the, the momentum of the system um, isn't, isn't conserved. But the angular momentum is conserved because the force on that point doesn't cause a torque because it's a force on the pivot point. I'm saying these things to you because when I ask you these on the test and you have to explain why, I'm giving you the why. When it says something like justify your reasoning about why the force on the pivot point doesn't apply a torque, it's because it's at the pivot point and the torque arm is zero. So it says that it has an angular velocity of omega. Now, I know that that means you guys have to go, but I'm going to write down how to do the answer. The angular momentum before the collision has to be equal to the angular momentum of the ball after the collision. The ball is a point mass. So the right side is going to be r cross p. The left side is going to be i omega, which is one-third ml squared times omega. Now, r cross p is r p sine phi or r perpendicular mv. So I'm going to continue. I don't want to be distracted. This is going to equal L. We'll use L for r because it's the perpendicular distance times mv times the sine of 90 degrees. Remember, this is the instantaneous moment the ball leaves. And we know that after the collision, there is an angular momentum for the bar, just the ball. So it's a point mass. And at that instant, this is the angle that its velocity makes with the distance from the pivot point. So from there, I'll put M1 and M2. We can cancel out one of the L's and sine of 90 is one. So the velocity is gonna be M1L over 3M2. I'll do my best.